Welcome to Chapter 10, Section 2, Notes. Um, we're going to start with the real number system. This should be review. We've talked about this earlier in the year. So let's, let's start on the innermost circle and review. Natural or county numbers are those numbers you first learned to count with. One, two, three, four, and so on. Whole numbers, I always would remind you that there's an O in whole, and whole numbers include the zero. And then there are integers, which are the numbers you think of on a number line. So they're the positive whole numbers, the negative whole numbers, and zero. And then rational numbers. And I always reminded you that the root word in rational is ratio, like A to B, or numbers that can be written as a fraction. Rational numbers, like one half, anything that can be written as a fraction. <clears throat> Point one repeating is one ninth, so it can be written as a fraction. Irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be written as a fraction, like pi or the square root of two. Those are irrational numbers. Now there is another category of non-real numbers, and those numbers have a name, they're called imaginary, and we are not, we're gonna save that for your upper level math classes. Imaginary numbers, but here's an example of one of those. How about the square root of negative two? <clears throat> Where I've told you every time, there is no real solution for the square root of a negative. So that is an example of a non-real number or an imaginary number. <clears throat> Our first example is asking you to categorize each of these numbers by one of the categories above. So two, we're supposed to name all the sets that they belong to. So two is counting, two is whole, it is also an integer, and it is rational, and it is real. It is a real number. Negative five starts with integers because it's negative, and it's rational, and it's real. Zero is that first whole number, so that makes it also an integer, a rational number, and real. One half is a rational number and it is real. 0 0.3, can I write that as a fraction? Sure I can, that's 3 over 10, so that makes it rational and real. 0.4 repeating, that would be 4 over 9, so that makes it rational and real. <clears throat> Zero. 0.246, we've got the 4, 6 repeating. As long as there's a repeating pattern, it is still rational and real. And the square root of 144 is 12. We learned that yesterday. <clears throat> so 12 is a counting number, a whole number, an integer, a rational number, and it's real. Negative 7.25. Now, if it was just negative 7, we'd say it's an in integer, but because it's a decimal or a rational number, a fractional number, we have to only say it's rational and real. And the square root of 22 would be an example of one of those that I cannot write as a fraction, but it's still a real number, so it is irrational, but it is still real. Irrational, why? Because I cannot write the square root of 22 as a ratio or a fraction. <clears throat> Example two, fill in each box um, with greater than, less than, or equal to. So the square root of 125 gives me 11.18. And 11 and 7 eighths is the equivalent of equivalent of 8.875, so 11 and 7 eighths is greater. <clears throat> the square root of 57 is 7.55, and 7 and 2 fifths is 7.4, so the square root of 57 is greater. Okay, put the next numbers in numerical order. Well, the first thing I have to do to put them in numerical order is to convert them 
So 6 and 1 fourth is 6.25. The square root of 38 is 6.16. 6 6.5 repeating, and the square root of 36 is 6. So the square root of 36 is the least. It says numerical order. Pay attention. Sometimes it'll say greatest to least or least to greatest. Numerical order, of course, means smallest to largest. Next would come 6.16, which was the square root of 38. Don't give me 6.16. Give me the original numbers that were in the problem. Then next comes 6 and a quarter. And then last is, and definitely not least, because it's the biggest number, is 6.5 repeating. So this is your answer, your solution set, when you put them from least to greatest or numerical order. Why don't you pause right here and see if you could do B without me. Okay, hopefully you went ahead and converted the square root of 30 to 5.477, and 5.6 was given. 15 divided by 3 is 5, and 5 and 2 thirds is 5.6 repeating. So when you list them from least to greatest, your answer should look like this, and this is 5 and 2 thirds. All right, flip your paper over to the back. All right, I'm calling this part 2 of section 10-2, uh, where we're reviewing again how to solve equations. Remember, this is the golden rule of algebra. <coughs> The golden rule says to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and the golden rule for algebra says do to one side of an equation as you do to the other. We're going to use inverse operations to undo what's being done to x. So our first review problem is x plus 2 equals 5, so it's adding to x, so to undo addition, you subtract 2, and x equals 3. Here, x is being multiplied times 3, so to undo multiplication, you'll divide by 3, and x equals 6. And here, we have a two-step equation. So first, we have to take care of isolating our x term, so we subtract 6 from both sides, and we get 4x equals 16. Divide now to undo the multiplication. Oh, that's an equals. 4x equals 16. Divide by 4, and x equals 4. So hopefully you remember solving for equations. Now we're going to add to the mix squares and square roots. Squares and square roots are also called inverse operations. To undo something being squared, you take the square root. So for the first um, equation, we have x being squared. We need to undo what's happening to x, so we need to take the square root of x squared, which means we have to do the same thing to both sides of the equation. I can't take the square root of x and not take the square root of Okay, so we're undoing <clears throat> what's being done to x, and x is being squared, so we're taking the square root of x. Well, if I take the square root of x, I have to also take the square root of 144. So when I take the square root of x squared, I get x. Now, when I take the square root of 144, I'm asking x times itself gives us positive 144. What number times itself gives us positive 144? Well, that can be either positive or negative 12. Now, in our homework last night, we just had plain old the square root of 144, and they said, give us a positive 12. However, it had, if it had been negative square root of 144, you would give us negative 12. Those were the two different types of problems you had in your homework. Now, we are solving for x, so it's a whole new ball game. What can I plug in for x, square it, and get 144? Don't forget that negative 12 squared gives us a positive 144 also. So it's got to be positive or negative 12. They both give us 144 when we check it. So our answer is positive or negative 12. For this next problem, I have to do two steps. <clears throat> First, I have to get my x isolated. So what's happening to x squared? It's being multiplied by 3. So I need to divide by 3. And that'll let us have x squared equals 121. Now to undo x being squared, I'll take the square root. So I have to do the same thing to both sides. 
and I get x equals positive or negative 11. Please do not forget that it's got to be positive or negative because negative 11 squared is also positive 121. In most real world situations, negative square roots do not make sense. Okay, if we were talking about a measurement, we would throw out a negative. If we were talking about time, we would throw out a negative. So if so, you only consider the positive answer. The positive answer is also known as, aka, the principal root. The principal square root is the positive root. So if you ever hear someone talk about the principal square root, you know they're talking about the positive square root. But because we do not know in these algebra problems if it's um, time or distance, we have to say it could be positive or negative. Now this next example, we know what we're talking about. This is a formula uh, for aspect ratio. I'm not familiar with the aspect ratio, but they're going to tell me everything I need to know even though I've not really ever used this equation before. R, it said, is the ratio that we're looking for. S stands for the wingspan in feet. A is the area of the wing. <clears throat> so what is the wingspan of a hang glider if the aspect ratio is 6.4? What is 6.4? The ratio, so that's capital R. And the area of the wingspan is 40. Okay, so that was the other A, the area of the wingspan. And it said, or excuse me, the area of the wingspan. So what is the wingspan? I'm looking for S. The wingspan is S. So they've given us everything we need to plug into R equals S squared divided by A. Capital R is the ratio. That's 6.4 equals. I plugged it in for R. 6.4 equals. Um, Capital A is the area of the wing. The area of the wing, wing is 40. So the area of the wing is 40. And then I am looking for the wingspan, which was S. And that in this situation is S squared. So the first thing I have to do is undo what's happening to my S squared and it's being divided. So the opposite or the inverse operation of division is multiplication. So we want to multiply both sides by 40. These 40s will cancel and I have S squared equals 40 times 6.4 gives me 256. So now to get S unsquared, I'm going to be taking the square root of both sides and the square root of 256, if you didn't know, is 16. So in an algebra problem, we would say S equals positive or negative 16. But for this problem, what are we looking for? <clears throat> the wingspan of a hang glider. Can a hang glider have a negative wingspan? No. So we know that the wingspan must be the positive or the principal square root, which is 16. <clears throat> All right. Another word problem. A tsunami is caused by an earthquake on the ocean floor. The speed of a tsunami can be measured by this formula. Again, it's a formula. I don't really know. I don't do a lot with tsunamis. But this is a formula, and they're going to tell us what the S stands for and what the D stands for. Where S is the speed of the wave in meters per second, and D is the depth of the ocean in meters, where the earthquake occurs. What is the speed of a tsunami? if an earthquake occurs at a depth of 632. So they've given us here the D. So I take my formula, 9.61 equals S squared over D. I see a pattern forming. We're always solving for the variable that's squared, it seems like, because we're working on square roots. D is 632. So to undo my division, I'm going to multiply both. We're going to multiply both sides by 632, and 632 will cancel. Now, we're solving for S. Class, you're going to have to finish this on your own. We want to take the square root after we multiply here and know that S is measuring the speed of a tsunami. So S cannot be negative. 
So give me your best answer tomorrow, and you all have a great day.